chaos on Capitol Hill late into the evening yesterday. The Republican-led House failed in its attempt to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, falling one vote short. Republicans Ken Buck of Colorado, Tom McClintock of California, and Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin voted against the measure. Republican Conference Vice Chair Blake Moore then flipped his vote to no seconds before the vote closed, so the party can bring the articles of impeachment back to the floor at a later date. Democratic Congressman Al Green had missed votes on the issue earlier in the day because he was in the hospital recovering from abdominal surgery, but he was able to show up at the last minute for the final vote. Republican Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene suggested that that was a sneaky move. They hid one of their members uh, waiting to the last minute, uh, watching to see our votes, um, trying to throw us off on the numbers that we had versus the numbers they had. So, yeah, that was a strategy at play tonight. Oh, uh, got it, got it. A spokesperson. I don't even for, know what to say about that. Nuts. He it's, voted. He came. You're supposed the to job. vote. There's nothing sneaky it's about the job. it. job. Got a voting card. I'm here. Yeah. Vote. A spokesperson, just spokesperson for Speaker Mike Johnson says Republicans will bring the articles of impeachment back to the floor when the House has enough votes to pass it. So this is what they're doing with their time. No. Let's bring in the host of Way Too Early, White House Bureau Chief at Politico, Jonathan Lemire. Deputy Managing Editor of For Politics at Politico, Sam Stein. MSNBC contributor and author of the book, How the Right Lost Its Mind, Charlie Sykes. Good morning to talk uh, about that book this morning. And NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Julie Serkin is with us as well. Good to have you all on board. So, uh, Julie, uh, tell us what in the world happened. I mean, you guys saw it. I'm glad you had to go back and rewatch C-SPAN because I think we all were glued to C-SPAN last night. I mean, this was really stunning, and it was a bad week for Republican leadership, not only in the House but also in the Senate because of everything you just went through with the border bill. This was absolutely stunning on the floor. Actually, uh, Speaker Mike Johnson and his leadership team spent a long time on the floor trying to pressure Mike Gallagher, one of those no's, trying to get him to flip, to vote for impeaching Alejandro Mayorkas. He said he would not. You also had the same effort happen with Ken Buck, the Colorado Republican, who said that he is retiring from Congress. So he doesn't have uh, any reason to flip and go uh, with what Republicans want on this because he said that this Mayorkas's impeachment does not rise to the, the level of high crimes and misdemeanors. Nonetheless, they're going to try this again, guys. And Steve Scalise, who's the majority leader who's been out for cancer treatment, he's going to come back at some point in February to try and get this done. The question is, uh, under House rules, how many days do they have to bring this up again? House, the House majority, uh, the Republican majority feels confident they can do it, but it is quite embarrassing. And I can't remember the last time, if ever, that they pursued impeachment, especially of a cabinet secretary, which hasn't been successfully impeached in 150 years. And this kind of thing happened where they just didn't have the votes on the floor. So, so Charlie, they're, they're, right, they're, they're bringing up a BS impeachment, articles of impeachment. They're voting on it. They're failing. They're losing. They're, they're trying to, to get who other knew? funding. Uh, yeah, who knew? Uh, through the, they're, they're, they're failing on those votes. They bring up a resolution to try to polish off what Donald Trump did uh, when he committed insurrection. We could go down the list. I, I, I remain deeply troubled, though. They leave the border open as a political strategy. And they uh, allow Vladimir Putin uh, his dream of possibly one day being able to march into Kiev uh, because they won't fund Ukraine. And you do wonder. I, I know there have to be serious House Republicans in there. And I do wonder when they're yeah. going to stand up and speak out and say, we let Putin take Georgia in 2008. So he went into Ukraine in 2014. He went in again a couple of years ago. And after after we sit back and give him Ukraine, he'll then go after Poland. He'll then go after the Balkan states. And in their in their eyes, I mean, they'll have Donald Trump in the White House who will gladly let Putin do that. Like we, This is this is the worst invasion since World War II on the continent of Europe. And Republicans are saying, take it. 
I am so glad that you're connecting all the dots because, of course, you know, that was a, you know, shambolic clown car we saw yesterday. Um, that, you know, we really, you know, yesterday was peak Republican dysfunction, but the collateral damage is going to be immense, you know, with the border, with Ukraine, with Israel, with our image in the world, with our relationship with our allies. So on the one hand, you're seeing these bad performance artists like Marjorie Taylor Greene spend their time on this this sort of, of thing. You know, as and you, you see the the ongoing audition for the favor of, of Donald Trump. But meanwhile, there are real world consequences to all of this. I mean that was an embarrassing day. It was a humiliating day. It was a shameful day. But unfortunately to your question, I'm not sure that you know, this this party, um, you know, has the capacity to say, hey, this is just wrong. Um, this is not who we are. I have to admit that like everybody else, I was surprised by that vote. I was surprised that Mike Gallagher finally found a backbone and decided to stand up against him. And I imagine that the pressure on him is going to be absolutely intense uh, between now and next week on the Mayorkas uh, impeachment. But you can't unring a bell. You can't undo the humiliating embarrassment you saw yesterday, the dysfunction and the inability of the Republican Party to uh, be a serious governing party was on full display all day yesterday. And we're going to get and, and we're going to get a, a, you know, a replay of that again later today as well. Yeah, we're going to get a replay of that, Jonathan Lemire, on the immigration question with this cloture vote in the Senate expected to fail. They're not going to be allowed debate on, the, on this bill. Yesterday also, as we mentioned, there was a vote after the failed impeachment vote on standalone Israel aid. Again, this was a Republican idea, a Republican bill. That failed, too, and by a wide margin. So this House uh, not exactly covering itself in glory yesterday and more to come today. Yeah, more to come today. And just a complete abandonment of trying to actually govern here. Uh, that there, right now, unless something is completely a startling turnaround, there's not going to be a border security deal. There will not be aid to Ukraine. And we saw yesterday uh, national security officials saying that Russia was on the verge of its first victories in the, in the war, taking new Ukrainian territory since Bakhmut. So that's many, many months from now. We're seeing the tide of war turning a little bit there already. And Ukraine is going each and every day without the weapons and money they need from the United States. And we seem unwilling to send it that way. So certainly uh, this is Sam Stein going to hand President Biden a couple of significant campaign issues. He's going to be able to point at Republicans and say they abandoned Ukraine. Ukraine. They are the ones not securing the border. The president said yesterday he'll be out in the campaign trail making those those arguments. And it also seems like nothing's going to change because Speaker Johnson now, especially after this failed impeachment vote, his grasp on power that much more tenuous. He's going to have to do Donald Trump's bidding to the word. Yeah, it's hard to see Johnson turning around and then putting up a bill that gets majority Democrat support. I mean, his his position is incredibly weak this morning, much weaker than it was yesterday, uh, and it was pretty weak yesterday. Um, I'm sort of with you here, Jonathan. I, I have to, I, I, my assessment of yesterday was that the Mayorkas vote was, I mean, obviously an objective humiliation for House Republican leadership, but ultimately sort of on a substantive level, I don't think it was as significant as the defeat of this border bill in the Senate uh, that is coming today. Uh, for that reason, two reasons. One, uh, Mayorkas' impeachment was never going to happen, even if the House recommended the articles of it to the Senate. The trial would have been quick. They would have dismissed it. Uh, we would have gone on with our lives. Uh, it would, it's a show, uh, more or less. Yeah. But the border bill, uh, really, you know, that is the key to unlock uh, a whole host of different foreign policy priorities. And I think the dysfunction in the Senate uh, among Republicans there is, to a degree, more significant than the House. I mean, we sort of expect the House Republicans to operate this way. Uh, I guess that's the bigotry of low expectations, but it's true. Uh, the expectation was the Senate would operate slightly differently. And I'm just struck by, someone put it like in a headline that I thought was a pretty remarkable, and it was, I'm, I'm summarizing here, but it's like, uh, Senate Democrats fail to persuade Republicans to pass conservative border bill. And that's essentially what happened, right? Like, this is a conservative yeah. border bill that Democrats were saying you should pass, and they said no. And because of that, we will not likely have uh, Ukraine aid, Israel aid, Taiwan aid, uh, aid for Palestinians. Yeah. Here's how we know this was never about securing the border for the Republicans. The Border Patrol Union, which endorsed Donald Trump in both 2016 and 2020, came out this week in support of the border deal.
Yesterday, we heard from the group's president on Fox News, even as Republican House leadership continued to dismiss the union's backing of the bill. I understand politics and I can understand why Republicans would go against this for political purposes. I get that. There, there is that aspect to it. This bill transcends um, administrations. This will go beyond Biden. It will go beyond Trump. It will go beyond the next president. So I'm looking at this from the standpoint of we need something that is going to continue to go past and not just executive orders. There are plenty of weaknesses in here, but there's there's also a lot of strengths. And, and when you look right now, what we're currently dealing with, um, w this is a slow month, and we're dealing with 6,700 apprehensions on a daily basis. What this would do is it would cap it to where we couldn't take anything more than 5,000. Now, this does not say that we're going to release 5,000 people into the United States. In fact, it's, it's the exact opposite. It says that we will hold single adults in custody. Um, they will not be subject to release. I know a lot of Republicans are against it because Donald Trump is against it. But here's here's the problem for you guys. Uh, the Border Patrol Union came out and the acting CBP chief both came out and said they're not. It's not perfect, but this is the best thing we've seen in decades. So are Republicans going to say that the Border Patrol Union and the acting CBP chief are wrong? Well, look, they can have their perspective, Steve, uh, and we've it's got a lot of respect. It's their jobs, Tom. We've, well, and it's our job to uh, actually make sure the laws will accomplish what we're seeking to do. It's unbelievable. It's un <laughs> I mean, I guess it's not unbelievable. I'm sorry. This is not unbelievable. That this bill was moving towards passage, and then Donald Trump said, kill it because it will make the situation better at the southern border. And that might hurt me politically, just like Donald Trump said he wanted America to be plunged into a Great Depression. Uh, so so now we find out. After all these years. I mean, I got to say this is so foreign to me, this would never have happened to the people that I serve with in Congress. It just would have never happened. Like if there was something important for the country and people came around, Tom DeLay came around whipping it for the other side or whoever, came, you know, and they were pressured to tell them to go to hell. And they'd say, no, we're going to back off. We're going to vote for this bill because it's good for America. We don't care if it's not good for the Republican Party or the Republican leadership. A federal appeals court has rejected Donald Trump's claim that he is immune from prosecution in his election interference case. The three-judge panel of the D.C. Circuit Court appeal, Appeals Court of Appeals ruled unanimously yesterday that there was no basis for Trump to assert former presidents have blanket immunity from prosecution or any acts committed as president. The 57-page ruling states that former President Trump is no longer the president and has become citizen Trump for the purposes of criminal prosecution. Trump had argued in part that, quote, criminal liability for former presidents risks chilling presidential action while in office and opening the floodgates to meritless and harassing prosecution. But the appeals court found that risk appears to be low. Trump reacted on his social media platform, writing, quote, a nation destroying ruling like this cannot be allowed to stand, calling the ruling, quote, so bad and so dangerous. The former president is expected to appeal to the Supreme Court soon. I think he has until Monday to do so in a bid to prevent the trial from going ahead as scheduled. The D.C. Circuit panel cut the time Trump has to file an appeal down significantly. Usually it's a few months. He's yeah. got till Monday. Until Monday, let's bring her in. Former litigator and MSNBC legal analyst Lisa Rubin and also former U.S. attorney and MSNBC contributor Chuck Rosenberg. Chuck, uh, first of all, let's let's talk about the fact how this was a, a unanimous uh, uh uh, 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 ruling and um, how people were wondering why it was taking so long. Uh, it, talk about how uh, how maybe that delay was was caused by uh, wanting a unanimous uh, a unanimous ruling. Yeah, Joe. Well, first of all, from my perspective, having litigated in the courts of appeal, it didn't take all that long. I mean, it was a little mm -hmm. bit less than four weeks. Uh, I know that's slow in journalism world. I get that. 
But I think in lawyer world, that's relatively quick. Second to your point, the judges wrote um, one opinion per curiam, meaning for the court, of the court. Mm -hmm. They all joined a single opinion. It's 57 pages long. I read it yesterday. It's thoughtful. It's forceful. And the fact that they were unanimous and of one voice, I think, lends some heft to their opinion. And so taking a little bit more time to get it right, because you know this opinion will be subject to enormous scrutiny, I think is well worth it. So unanimity was important. The forcefulness of the opinion was important. Uh, the fact that it took a little bit longer than folks might have liked, in my view, doesn't matter all that much. Yeah, so uh, for uh, cert to be granted, uh, f you have, have to have four justices. Is that correct, Chuck? Yes, yeah, that's right. Uh, four ju and, and, and I would guess, and, and, and Lisa, uh, Chuck, tell me if I'm wrong, I would guess that the institutionalist in John Roberts is thinking, we want to stay out of politics. We want as little to do with this as possible. We're already handling the Colorado exactly. case. I'm, I'm, I'm curious if you all think that Roberts wants to find uh, the, uh, the six uh, members of the court uh, who will deny cert. Uh, so maybe he's talking to Brett Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett, trying to get that sixth vote to keep mm -hmm. this away and just affirm the lower court ruling. What do you guys think? Oh. I defer to Lisa. Well, one of the things, Joe, that I think is important to point out for our viewers is, yes, it takes four votes to grant cert here, but it takes five votes to grant a stay. And in reality, the stay is the name of the game because that order that accompanied yesterday's decision essentially says, Donald Trump has until Monday to file a motion for stay pending the court's review of his cert petition. If he can't get those five votes, even if he has four votes to review it, that also means that without a stay, the Court of Appeals issues its mandate. That's a fancy way of saying it kicks the case back to Judge Chetkin. So Trump could simultaneously get Supreme Court review, but also have pretrial proceedings and allow Judge Chutkin to move forward. That would make the court review in some respects meaningless if she's empowered to forge ahead. Well, I was going to ask you about that, Lisa. It was just a couple of days ago that Judge Chutkin vacated the March 4th trial date and said, we're waiting on this immunity decision, so now we'll have to reschedule everything. Given that this decision came down a day later, how soon do you think she can get this case back on the docket? Judge Chetkin wrote a decision, Willie, at one point where she said it was important to her to grant the parties about seven months to prepare for trial. It seems to me that she is committed to giving Trump that same seven-month period, not including the periods of time during which the case has been stayed. So if, for example, the Supreme Court were to deny the stay application from Trump and or deny cert relatively quickly, she would then probably take that up on that day and add eight or nine weeks. However long we've been delayed, you can think of her adding that back onto the trial calendar. She might shorten it a little bit to ensure that she's at trial. But this is also a judge who earlier this week contemplated she could be on trial in August at a January 6th related proceeding for another of the 1,300 plus defendants who have already been charged for that day, Judge Shutkin said, well, I'm planning to be out of the country in August. However, there's a possibility I could be on trial referring to this case. So I think it's within her contemplation that sometime in the July, August, perhaps even September range, she could be trying this case. But Chuck, obviously that's getting so close to the election. Uh, it would be in everybody's best interest from uh, well, just the, the, the court systems, the judiciary branches, uh, the Justice Department's for, for this case to be expedited. I'm curious, uh, for if, if Trump needs five justices, uh, I'm curious, what are your thoughts if, let's say, Roberts decides he wants to just, just uh, aff uh, affirm uh, the D.C. Circuit uh, ruling? Um, who is more likely to go his way? Do you think do you think he's, he's, he's talking to Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett, uh, to, to, to find uh, that fifth vote to deny, uh, to deny stay? Yeah, hard to know for sure, Joe, but, but here's my sense of it. The Court of Appeals decision was thoughtful and forceful, and I think solid, and forgive the pun, but unimpeachable. And I think that means that it will not be reviewed ultimately by the Supreme Court, at least not right now. 
I don't really see a path there. Look, the only party who benefits from delay, the only party is Mr. Trump. And so whether he gets five justices for a stay, as Lisa pointed out, or four to grant a petition of certiorari for the Supreme Court to hear the case, that's Mr. Trump's path. And I think whether you're a textualist or an originalist um, or just a thoughtful, smart justice of the Supreme Court, you read the D.C. opinion, it denies absolute immunity. It um, counters the notion that double jeopardy was implicated um, in this case. Uh, and the best thing to do, the smartest thing to do, the lawful thing to do is to send this back to Judge Chutkin and let her try it. I hope it's before the election. I still think it will be. I think that's very much on the table and in the cards. Um, but I think that's the path forward, Joe. So Donald Trump, of course, railed against this decision, saying that we're on the verge of losing our country, uh, Lisa. Um, and we know from the beginning that this was the one case that stood a chance of coming to trial and potentially even having a verdict before the election. Built for speed was how the, the, the phrasing was. Is there anything now that Jack Smith can do with that in mind? He's trying to build this for speed. Is there any, does he have any recourse here, any options to try to speed this along as these other things are happening? Well, usually it's the party who's seeking review who asks for that speed. However, you'll remember that before this went to the D.C. Circuit, Jack Smith moved for something called cert before judgment. He asked the Supreme Court essentially to leapfrog that D.C. Circuit and review it itself. He was not the losing party before Judge Chutkin, but he said, inevitably, this case is going to be reviewed. And so I'm going to ask you, Supreme Court, given that this guy doesn't like the decision, why don't you take it now and take it fast? And they denied his application within 11 days of his making it. However, I do think Jack Smith, when Trump files that motion on or before Monday, is going to say, if Trump doesn't, do it fast. Do it as fast as you possibly can. Make it possible for this case to be tried in the public's interest because, as you know, Jack Smith and even Merrick Garland have said, the public has an interest in this case moving to trial speedily. So Wisconsin is a key battleground state, and right now a political fight has been raging over a Republican effort to prevent the state Supreme Court from having the final say in how legislative districts are drawn. It's just one of several battles that have a huge impact on our democracy and the way power is wielded by the party hoping to stay in power. Joining us now, former U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder. He is chair of the National Democratic redistricting committee which brings legal challenges to gerrymandered redistricting maps for violations of the voting rights act he's been focusing on many of these showdowns we just talked about wisconsin but you're also looking at louisiana tell us about the situation there well, in Louisiana, uh, a bunch of citizens brought a lawsuit that we supported that challenged the way in which the districts were drawn there that had a negative impact on the ability of the black residents in Louisiana to have the full degree of political power to which they were entitled and which violated uh, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act of uh, 1965. Based on the Allen versus Milligan case, an Alabama case that we won before the United States Supreme Court, a very conservative United States Supreme Court, uh, we said that there's a basis to draw another black opportunity district uh, in Louisiana. In the South, mm -hmm. you have uh, places where you have racially polarized um, voting. And as a result of the Allen versus Milligan case, the lawsuit that we have brought, uh, another black opportunity uh, district has been created in Louisiana as well as in um, Alabama. So I, I want to get a sense of uh, the importance of this work um, across the country, even the implications of the case you were just talking about it. Could it impact how uh, the states deal with this question across the country? Yeah, I mean, the case that we won before the Supreme Court will have a nationwide impact and enhances the ability to use Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act to go after states that are trying to um, dilute the power of citizens mm -hmm. of color uh, with regard to their representation. But we've also been bringing lawsuits on other bases in other parts of the country, um, in Wisconsin, uh, Ohio, North Carolina. Uh, we brought a number of cases, all trying to make the system more fair. 
the reality is that gerrymandering is cheating. Uh, partisan racial gerrymandering is, is cheating and deprives the American people of the ability to have representatives who really represent uh, their policy desires. And, you know, it also, if you want to look at this immigration bill um, that is not going to get voted on, uh, one of the reasons it's not going to get voted on is because people, Republicans in particular, um, fear primary challenges. And that's what gerrymandering does. It makes you safe in a general election. And the only thing you're really worried about is a primary challenge. And therefore, you don't want to compromise with people across the aisle because that's seen as a sign of weakness. And that invites a primary um, challenge. So gerrymandering has uh, an impact on a whole range of things. Uh, and that's why we have decided to fight for um, fairness in our redistricting process. Mr. Attorney General, can you tell us a little bit more, if you will, <clears throat> about the ongoing impact that Donald Trump and his big lie has on this process, which, of course, has fueled voting rights changes in a number of straight, uh, states, restrictions, a uh, number of Republican-held legislatures. And the idea that he is, it's not just that what he did about 2020, but the fact that he is still out there, he's still pushing the big lie, and he's still the, the most dominant figure in Republican politics. Yeah, and that's one of the really negative impacts of what the former president has done. By, by pushing this, this lie that we have a voting system that is unfair, um, that is somehow corrupt, it, it allows Republicans and state legislatures to put in place measures that are designed to keep certain people away from the polls. Um, restrictive measures like unnecessary photo I ID laws, um, purging of voter rolls. Uh, there's a whole range of things that happen based on these um, these misperceptions, these lies that are perpetrated by the former president. And that's why, you know, we have to fight for uh, a fair system. It's what I've tried to do as the head of the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, not to fight for partisan advantage, but for fairness in the electoral system. I think if that's the case, you know, Democrats, uh, progressives, you know, will do just just fine. But we face, you know, that headwind that comes from the former president. Uh, and his acolytes um, saying that there is, in fact, voter fraud, when, in fact, you know, the Brennan Center did a study and said you're more likely to be hit by lightning, hit by lightning, than cast an in-person you know, fraudulent vote. Mm. And, and so these are the kinds of things that we have to push back against. Uh, Eric, I really want you to address another thing that the former president has done, and that is delegitimize the Department of Justice and the FBI. I don't think people realize the percentage of people who work for the Department of Justice and who work for the FBI that are the very definition of non-political. I don't think people realize that the vast majority of those employees are people who came to those institutions because of the work they wanted to do without any kind of political pre-notion of how they could affect politics or policy. Could you speak to that and the damage he has done to these really important institutions in terms of the rule of law? No, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, the notion that the Justice Department or the uh, FBI are, are peopled with, uh, you know, employees who have political leanings and who do things on the basis of uh, political favor is totally inconsistent with how the Department of Justice is run, how the FBI is run. Um, there is a, a way in which people in, in the department interact with one another where political things are not raised. Uh, I was a young lawyer in the Justice Department you know, a long, long time ago, and a person who I tried my first case with and who I had a great relationship with, I just assumed was a Democrat. I just assumed he was a Democrat. Uh, and after getting to talk to him over the years, I realized that he was a pretty conservative um, Republican. I never understood that, never knew that. It is something that is not discussed in the Justice Department. Uh, the career employees, that's something people need to understand. These are career employees who serve for 15 and 20 years, do so in an apolitical way, don't do anything on the basis of politics. And the way in which the former president and too many Republicans have attacked uh, those institutions has had a negative impact on their ability to do cases that are in the political sphere when they're doing political corruption cases, but also has a negative impact on the way in which juries look at people from the FBI when they are testifying in uh, non-political cases. So there's a, a negative systemic impact, institutional impact, um, that these lies have, uh, have had. Mr. Attorney General, good morning. As you know, a three-judge panel at the D.C. Court of Appeals yesterday ruled that Donald Trump does not have immunity. 
uh, as he has claimed and in these federal cases against him now can move forward. Are you surprised at all by that decision? And what's your expectation now as someone who has worked in the system for how soon the trial, for example, about the election interference around 2020 might proceed? Well, what I would say is that, first off, that was a good, thorough opinion, um, but it wasn't a tough case. Uh, the claims made by the former president uh, were pretty, you know, far-fetched. Um, uh, the claims were pretty uh, absurd, and I think those judges reached uh, the right decision. The question now is, what is the Supreme Court going to do? Uh, on the basis of, you know, the, the, the ridiculousness of the claims and the comprehensive nature of the um, opinion done by the judges of the, in the D.C. Circuit. Any other case, I, I think that the Supreme Court would not take the case. And that would be my hope here um, a, as well. The Supreme Court, I think, has a, um, a, a responsibility to protect the system. Uh, and among the things that is critical to our American judicial system is the right to a speedy trial. Uh, right, a defendant has a right to a speedy trial. The government has a right to a speedy trial. The public has a right to a speedy trial. That is codified in our law in Title 18 of the United States Code. Uh, so my hope would be that they will look at the case, look at the, the nature of, of the claims, and make a determination that they are not going to allow further delay. Because although the former president lost on the merits yesterday, he actually mm -hmm. has won because the case yes. against him has been delayed. And that's what he's really fighting for. He's fighting for delay. Um, I hope the Supreme Court uh, will look at this case in a realistic way and understand that delay uh, denies the American people of a bit of information that they need, a substantial amount of information that they're going to need before they make a very important decision uh, come early November. Absolutely. Former U.S. Attorney General and Chair of the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, Eric Holder, thank you very much for coming on the show this morning. We appreciate it. I know the structure bill is going to pass, but the leader of the Progressive Caucus in the House, Jamla Priapal, is balking. She said on Friday that, pa that voting on this bill tomorrow is an arbitrary date, adding that more than 50 members will vote no if you first don't have agreement on the broader social investment bill. So are you confident these progressive members are going to vote yes, even though she says no? What? Let me just say we're going to pass the bill this week. Uh, the, the, uh, I promised that we would bring the bill to the floor. That was according to the language that those who wanted this to be brought to the floor tomorrow wrote into the rule. We will bring the bill to the floor tomorrow for, for um, consideration. But you know, I'm never bringing a bill to the floor that doesn't have the votes. See, that's a good way to go. Uh, Mike Johnson might want to, I don't know, take a take a look at that. I'm never bringing a bill to the floor that doesn't have the votes. That's then Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi ended up not putting the 2021 infrastructure bill on the floor that week because she knew she didn't have the votes. She would work to secure them. The bill passed the House a month later and was signed into law by President Biden. Compare that to last night when Speaker Mike Johnson brought two measures to the floor that both failed. The first was an attempt to impeach the Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, by the way, for not securing the border, followed by the failure to pass a standalone bill on aid to Israel. And of course, they're trying to kill in the Senate a procedural vote on the border security bill that they themselves asked for and negotiated and would secure the border. Tonight, fashion and politics collide with the goal of bringing attention to the gender gap in the fashion industry and beyond. The Equal Rights Amendment Coalition is teaming up with fashion brand KZK Studio to host an event tonight ahead of the start of the New York Fashion Week this weekend. The event and fundraiser will include a panel featuring leaders in fashion and gender equality discussing the intersection of the Equal Rights Amendment and arts and culture. The ERA Coalition is an organization composed of nearly 300 groups, all with the same goal, to pass the Equal Rights Amendment, which was originally introduced more than 100 years ago and would constitutionally guarantee gender equality for men and women. 
Joining us now, the president of the ERA Coalition, Zakia Thomas, and board chairwoman, former New York Congresswoman, Carolyn Maloney. Thank you both very much for being on the show this morning. Congresswoman, um, first, where does ERA stand in the grand scheme of things across the country? Well, it's extremely important, particularly after the Dobbs decision, uh, which showed us that our rights, uh, abortion rights, can be taken away. And, Mika, that shows that any of our rights can be taken away. But there's been a string of elections and court decisions across the country that are an indicator of what's to come. And when we put the ERA with abortion rights, it is an absolute election winner. We're hoping this year... We will get a vote in the House and the Senate, hopefully mm -hmm. passing it. If we don't pass it, then at least we'll know where people stand and can certainly take that out to an election. And I can't understand why anyone should be in the United States Congress if they don't believe in equality of rights for men and women. Zakia, tell us about the coalition's work and also teaming up with KZK Studios and the, the motive and the message for tonight. So the ERA coalition is made up of over 300 partner organizations, as you mentioned, but we represent over 80 million people across the country, all working towards equality. And our goal really is to bring people together to recognize and uplift the Equal Rights Amendment and the fact that we don't have constitutional equality. And without it, our rights are very tenuous. One of the new uh, discoveries in the last few days has been that the these, uh, Pennsylvania Supreme Court has used their state ERA to uplift to support abortion rights. Um, and mm -hmm. today we're talking with KZK about the importance of having an equal rights amendment to protect pay equity for women in, uh, across the board. And Carolyn Maloney, you obviously, you and I both have been fighting for equal pay for as long as we've had a platform to fight with. How would uh, the ERA just kind of jumpstart uh, all of our efforts where still after, I don't know, 10 years that I've been in the game, we're still not paid equally to our male counterparts? Well, just in that, we would be able to enforce equal pay for equal work. We passed legislation right. saying that we should be paid equally. Well, you can't enforce it because right now you can discriminate against women. This would ban discrimination against women. You'd have a uniform treatment towards women across the country. I think it's outrageous that some states have... Uh, taken away abortion rights, which would women's rights should be uniform across the country, and you can write legislation that will make it even stronger. Uh, they would not have been able to repeal the access to abortion, which I thought was a constitutional right. I was shocked when they did it. I couldn't believe it. Uh, or take away our rights, uh, and they are threatening to do it, and if we don't fight back, uh, they'll just keep coming at us. It's this simple. If women are in the Constitution, then our rights are protected. And, and uh, we're half the population. Uh, and when you combine equality of, of rights, the ERA, with abortion rights, it polls at over 75 percent. It's an election winner. It's the right thing to do. And it's never too late to do the right thing. 100 years is long enough. Uh, this year, let's pass it. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Mika, for having us. And if I could ask you to sign our petition to show concretely that women and men are equally and that you support it. It's a uh, sign number four equal rights dot com dot org. And I, we hope to have millions so that we can show the weight of public opinion supporting equality of rights. Consider it done. Zakia, <laughs> tell us uh, what's going to happen tonight, sort of the pregame to Fashion Week and why the connection with Fashion Need. Fashion Week is actually quite significant. Well, you all, as we all know, arts are very important in our culture, and they help to transform culture uh, across our country. And so we are looking to combine the art uh, world, that's fashion, that's with our dendrophenology project that we had last November, to really show and highlight that this is an issue across sectors, and we need to make sure that we're addressing these issues. Right now we see that there are, that women in the fashion industry make less than men, and that the men are the ones in the positions of power. And we need to change that. We need to make our systems more equitable so that everyone has a seat at the table and they're able to be their fullest selves. Fabulous. Zakia Thomas, former Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, thank you both so much. And you can read much more about the gender gap and the fashion industry in our latest Know Your Value piece. It's online right now. Ladies, thank you. And the